live. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, we're live. Welcome to Dive Into World Building. And um, I'm Juliet Waite. And here we have K Tempest Bradford, the awesome. She is our guest today. Thank you for being here. Ah, thank you for having me. I'm excited. It took us a while to get this worked out, but we yeah. did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And for those of you who are wondering about the beautiful abstract art behind Tempest, <laughs> uh, it's paint swatches. <laughs> yep. It's all paint chips. I got the idea from the internet. So I was like, I need something cool to go behind me when I'm doing videos. So this is what I came up with. It's, it's rad. I love it. Okay. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> but of course we're here to talk about world building and, and, and fiction and all kinds of interesting things. So, um, one of the things that I read in preparation for today is a story called until forgiveness comes, which appeared in strange horizons. You should go read it very much worth your time. It's a very interesting story and, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I really felt like I was this was a, an NPR like alt universe um, <laughs> experience <laughs> complete with alt Sylvia Poggioli. Am I right? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> actually that, that was the literal inspiration for that story. And I set out to write a story that was just like uh, an NPR news report um, because I, what inspired it specifically was that several years after 9-11, after I felt like I had gotten sort of, I had gotten a handle on my emotions about it. I finally started listening to news reports on that day. And I, I listened to NPR a lot. And so I would listen to, was listening to the NPR reporting on the ceremony that took place um, at Ground Zero. And this is before the new towers went up. This was only like maybe five or so years after the attack, maybe not even that long. Um, and as I was listening to like what they did, uh, because there was a whole thing where they would have people who were either um, survivors or the families of victims come up and they would like read the names. And then there was like a bell struck for each of like the key moments when the first tower was hit and then when it went down and, and things like that. Mm. And I was like, oh, this is a ritual. Like I hadn't realized that we had ritualized this. And and it started me thinking about like how we deal with the ritualization of, of mass grief, you know, events that affect, you know, not just like one person or a small group of people, but like a city, a country, um, and how I felt about those things and how I felt about the way that things are being ritualized. And, and I didn't necessarily think they had been ritualized in a very healthy way, but, mm. um, but also like, I don't have a family member who, you know, was killed in those attacks. And I lived in New York City. And so I had a lot of like, there was stuff, but I wasn't there, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so a lot of my feelings, you know, were, were along those lines, but I didn't want to make a, a direct correlation because I know that, you know, around that time there, there was quite a bit of fiction that was literally just like, we're just going to talk about 9-11. And I mm -hmm. wanted to go a little bit more in the allegorical route. Uh, and so that's, that's where the sort of story seed came for that one. Yeah. Um, I could feel all of those things happening in that story. And I, I think it's really, really interesting the way that you did it. Um, it's got this sort of fantastical feel to it with the way that the ritual proceeds and, and everything else. And you've got the contrast between people's extreme emotions and then the the report format which i think is also really interesting um was that so like i mean you said that you were inspired to do it by npr reporting on this event so was were you directly thinking about that contrast as you wrote it or were you um or were you just sort of saying well i'm gonna do this without sort of emphasizing that i i actually was thinking about that and i was also thinking about how in, in particular NPR, the way that things are reported are often, there's like a tone, yeah. right? There's a tone to NPR where 
um, it's not even necessarily that it's neutral, but it's very calm. Like even when they're talking about things where you really shouldn't be calm about it, NPR's tone is usually very calm. And I think that's one of the things that sort of appealed to me thinking about it in that way, because like, it's not a calm situation, but you have this sort of calm voice talking to you about the situation. And I also wanted to have a format where I could present multiple sides Mm -hmm. um, without necessarily like taking a side because yeah, I, because like I said, my feelings about it were really complicated and my feelings were also complicated by the fact that like I come from a certain position, but other people, you know, come from very different ones. And so I felt like I really wanted to explore all those different ones. But the other thing was I, I really wanted to explore the feelings of people who are connected but not sympathetic or at least not people that we always sympathize with so I Mm. I definitely want to include that in the story too and again like it felt like the news report format would allow me to do that in such a way that it it wouldn't come across as like cheap necessarily um so yeah I I did that and then I spent a long time actually thinking about like okay so so where how do I want to spec ficify this story and and in the end i came up with sort of a a fantasy alternate world in which there's you know the dominant cultural force in on this continent was uh egypt instead of europe so Mm, okay so yeah because i was like who who's obsessed with death and death rituals aha (laughs) (laughs) yeah many many people in fact (laughs) yeah yeah so i i i've been researching egypt for other projects for a really long time so egypt is like sort of always in my brain um and and yeah like and it's interesting because like now that i've done more research like i've been researching egypt for so very long um but like i've had like a lot of like really interesting leaps in my more recent research and i sometimes when i look back at that story i'm like oh, I shouldn't have done that. I should have said this instead uh, in terms of like something like from ancient Egyptian culture or whatever, but nothing that I'm like, I'm completely embarrassed to even look upon this. It was more just like, oh. you're not embarrassed to look upon (laughs) it. No, it's just more like, oh, I I definitely would have like crafted like how the the modern culture would have looked a little bit differently knowing some of the things I know now about ancient Egyptian culture, so. Um, Yeah. So I, I actually have a question. Um, what In what context have you been researching Egypt? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I have been attempting to write a novel set in ancient Egypt since I was in college. Uh, and I don't want to talk about how many years ago that was, but it's been a long time. Um, and I sympathize. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and, and actually like the, the specific, it's not one specific project. It's sort of been like a grouping of projects that have, more metamorphosized over the years um and so i started out wanting specifically to write a novel based on the life of the pharaoh akhenaten Mm. and and i was inspired to do this by like these connections between akhenaten and oedipus and sort of like doing an oedipus cycle but in ancient egypt and when i was in when i was just out of college and trying to write this I did ha- reach a point where I was like, you know what? I don't really have the skills to do this well. Like I've never even written a novel, much less like this very ambitious, like Oedipus cycle novel that I'm <laughs> like trying to get, get through. So at some point I did like specifically put it on the back burner, but I kept doing research. But because of my original focus, I just started learning a lot about a specific time period in um, ancient Egypt, which is the 18th dynasty. And like Akhenaten is like at the end of that dynasty, Tutankhamun is his son. And so like people know a lot about what went on in the 18th dynasty. There's a lot of research there. Uh, So that was like my particular focus. So I can tell you a lot about the 18th dynasty. I can't necessarily tell you a lot about all the other eras and, you know, ancient Egyptian culture lasted for a couple thousand years. So, so there yeah. are like many changes, but, uh, but yeah, that was, that was my particular focus. That's why I started doing it. So, um, are you still working on that original project or are you, have you moved on to other, th- other projects within that sphere at this point? Um, what ended up happening was that I started writing 
a steampunk novel set in ancient Egypt. And that was just based on like conversations that I've been having with people about steampunk and about like sort of the limits of it or like pushing the boundaries of it. And I was like, okay, I can write like a short story set in ancient Egypt and have it be steampunk. And like everything in my life since Clarion West, uh, that short story became some sort of horrendous novel. And I'm like, why do you do this to me? Like, I just wanted to write a short story. I was out here to have a good time and I feel so attacked. Um, so, <laughs> I totally relate though. <laughs> right, it's just like, ah, how did this happen? But um, in the course of thinking about that short story, which is actually like set at the beginning of the 18th dynasty, um, I was like, oh, wait a minute. Like I have this story to tell and you know, this, is, this can be encapsulated over here. And I was like, but there's totally a way in which I could carry forward the, the steampunk elements and the cultural elements that I've created for this novel into the Akhenaten novel that I had planned before. And like, there are lots of things that are gonna be different about that novel because of things that I have learned in the many years since I've been researching about Akhenaten, about uh, Egyptian culture that are very different from what I thought about Egyptian culture back when I was, you know, just leaving college. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that story was always going to be very different anyway, but now I'm like, oh, I could totally make this part of this steampunk world. So I sort of have a kind of plan to like move through the 18th dynasty with the steampunk stuff and the, you know, there's giant flying scarab beetles made out of copper that run on the heat of the sun. So it could happen. Akhenaten could ride one of those. Just be like, peace out. I'm riding my scarab away from you. <laughs> wow. That sounds amazing. <laughs> I, 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 I totally want to read it. So, you know, in your free time. <laughs> <laughs> supposed to have been writing like I've been I've been writing that steampunk novel for oh god like now it's been three and a half years and but for most of last year I actually wasn't writing on it because of difficulties uh but right now I'm working on a middle grade novel that's not set in that world but once I'm done with the middle grade novel like I have I have this energy that I feel like okay now I can go back to the Egypt novel because I mean I went all the way to Egypt to, <laughs> to like research and stuff so i have to write this novel now because i went all the way to egypt i can't just be like well i went there oh well <laughs> <laughs> right yeah um well it's a it sounds like a considerable investment of time and effort so yeah i i would expect it to be absolutely amazing and I and so. the giant flying scarab beetles sound awesome <laughs> Yeah, that's and that's the place where I started from when I was like steampunk Egypt. And I was like, hmm, giant flying scarab beetles that run on heat from the sun. That's pretty steampunky. Let's just go there. And then I had to sort of build out from there. You know what? That sounds great. <laughs> you could start anywhere. What I mean, like, as and in the context of the show, right? We talk about world building over and over and over and all these different angles and whatever. And one of the things that we're always talking about is really everything is interconnected and you can pretty much start anywhere. Mm -hmm. So that's a perfect example. <laughs> it's like you had this, you have this really great visionary sort of thing that appears in your brain and you're like, let's go from there. Right. Let's that's awesome. From there. Yeah. I, I remember um, China Mieva once told me that like the thing that where he starts is like, I think up a really cool monster. And then, and I'm like, okay, yes, I can tell because you love those monsters a whole extra lot. Um, but like, yeah, it's like, that's a perfect place to start. Like super cool monster. We got to build a world around this to make it happen. So yeah, like I, I came up with the idea for these beetles and then I was like, well, you know, like what, what would be going on in Egyptian culture that they would build this or want to build this. And I, I tied it to, a lot of my sort of more esoteric research in terms of like uh, the kind of technology that the ancient Egyptians had. Um, I, I watched some episodes of Ancient Aliens. Uh, that's always fun. It's always, actually, I feel like Ancient Aliens is a really great place to go to find ideas for science fiction because obviously, obviously, you do not want to go there to find nonfiction in the ancient alien show but they have some really great ideas that can like flow right into fiction i i caught one episode once where they were talking about different pyramids 
around the globe and something about like pyramids in China where the there are all these like pipes and stuff underneath the pyramid. And they're like, what, what was it for? And I'm like, steam, duh, <laughs> because it was steampunk, duh. Come on, guys. <laughs> Come on. How can you not know? So, yeah. Well, I, I, I love, I love the, I love the diversity of the sources that you're employing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it was aliens, but it's aliens. Oh yeah. Aliens. <laughs> I feel like that's, that's probably like the one frustrating thing about doing independent research into um, Egyptological stuff is that, you know, you'll just be going along and you'll be like, oh, this is a great article. Oh, this is something interesting. And then you click on a link that seems perfectly innocuous. And then they're like, aliens. And you're like, oh, <laughs> not aliens. And they're like, no, it wasn't aliens, Atlantis. No, please. So yeah. <laughs> um, I can see that actually. Yeah, it's it's kind of a problem. Um, because yes, like there's, there are lots of, you know, perfectly wonderful, you know, research avenues and lots of perfectly reasonable sort of alternate, alternate to sort of academic Egyptology ideas about what was going on in ancient Egypt that I'm 100% here for. But I sort of shut down the minute people start being like aliens. Right. Because, I mean, really. <laughs> yeah. Um. Cool. Well, um, you did mention that you have a middle grade novel that you're working on. Would you like to tell us about that as well? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, it's called Ruby versus the Big Red Bug, and uh, I, I have a completed draft. I actually put uh, as I was writing it, I put it up on my Patreon, the the zero draft, and now I'm in the middle of revising it. And that one, um, it's actually it's science fiction, but it's set in sort of a more like real world setting. It's about a little girl who she wants to be an entomologist. She's very smart. And one day she finds a super weird bug in her yard and then she captures it and then it escapes. And then the men in black show up looking for it. And she's like, why are you here for some bug? And they're like, it's nothing, it's fine. And she knows it's not nothing and it's not fine. <laughs> and, and then, you know, things in their neighborhood start to disappear. You know, it's just like shenanigans. So. Um, I'm having a lot of fun with that one, um, in part because I decided when I was like, okay, I'm going to do this because this was like based on an image that I saw that I really loved of like a little girl, like fighting a giant red alien thing with like uh, a water gun. And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's awesome. I love this. Um, and so I... So when I decided, I was like, okay, I want this, this little black girl to be my protagonist. And I was like, I want her to be super smart. I want her to be like really into science and really focused on a thing. Um, and, you know, being an entomologist seemed to like be natural since so she would be really interested in bugs. Um, and I also decided that like where I was going to put her was essentially the neighborhood that I grew up in um, or one of the neighborhoods I grew up in and like give her the kind of sort of familial and neighborhood community that I had mm. when I was a kid, even though the, the neighborhood doesn't exist exactly that way now, mm -hmm. but it's also kind of my hope for the future. Like the way that I'm constructing how things work, it's not necessarily that things have always been the same since, you know, whatever time, just like when I was a kid, it's that, you know, things things were different and then the community came together to make things the way that they are and so it's like kind of my I hope this for the future kind of world building going on there and so yeah um but but it's all sort of based on the way things were when I was a kid like for instance uh the kids in the, the neighborhood are allowed to like go like walk around the neighborhood by themselves or like ride their bikes uh, up and down the block and mm -hmm. all these things that apparently it's too scary to let anybody do anymore. Um, I have lots of thoughts and feelings about that, but, um, but also one of the reasons why 
we were able to do that as kids is because everybody in the neighborhood was always up in our business. And <laughs> so like, there's always people like out on porches, um, you knew all the people or the majority of the people who lived up and down your block. Um, and so like, if you're going like down the street to go visit your friend, like you say, I'm going to visit Alicia and then you get there. And then if your parents call there asking for you, they expect you to be there. And if you're not there, then you're going to get told on by everybody in the neighborhood. Like, so like, there's not a lot <laughs> you can get away with when yeah. you live in a neighborhood where like everybody sort of knows each other and everybody's in everybody's business, but like in the good way, in the community looking out for each other way. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's the kind of world that I wanted my character to exist in, even though like she gets into some shenanigans, but she has to plan around the fact that everybody's looking. She's like, all right, we're going to do this. But if we do this, we got to do it at five 30 when everybody's inside cooking dinner. <laughs> so that she can avoid the neighborhood surveillance system that's kind of fun i mean i always love i love how social details will add so much richness and and texture and and complexity to a story even when they're very simple on a very simple level yeah no that's pretty awesome i'm writing notes over here <laughs> okay <laughs> I've been doing it all along. <laughs> Yay. Yay. There's also a giant thing that comes busting out of a wall. It's great. There's a giant thing that comes busting out of a wall? Yeah. Okay. I, I definitely already approve. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm having like giant red bug Kool-Aid man crossover. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Oh, yeah. And then he's like, oh, wait, nobody wants me. Oh, no. <laughs> I did it now in my head. <laughs> That's very, very cool. So, um, awesome, awesome stuff. Um, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by by these projects. Do you have anything else in the way of you know, like personal writing projects that you'd like to talk about? Um, because I know I do want to talk about your work for writing the other, but I want to make sure that we're we're giving plenty of space for you know your own personal geekery. Cool. Thanks. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's not a lot else going on right now because I'm a very like, I have to do this one thing and focus on it like type of person at this point. Like I actually don't understand how people have that energy to be working on like 12 things at once. I'm like that. I, my brain doesn't work that way. So yeah. So I'm trying to, yeah, just get the revision of this middle grade done um, so that I can then get back to working on the steampunk novel. Um and and also like give my poor patrons more content because I feel like I feel so bad for my patrons sometimes because I'm like sorry I don't have that content for you like I was I was writing a story for Christmas that didn't get done that I like literally posted on December 31st I posted the first third of it because I was like this is <clears> not getting done because once again I was like this will be short and it became freaking complicated but <laughs> it's basically I was like looking at all the like sort of hallmark movie madness that goes on starting in September mm -hmm. um, where they're like new Christmas movies like ah. and then they you know they have all these very like recognizable tropes so, like every hallmark movie like picks from a bag of 12 things that it can do um, yeah. and it's amazing how they get away with that because there's something like 40 movies every year that use these formulas um, so I decided to like let my patrons pick some tropes for me to use in a Christmas story. So I wrote the story about uh, a woman who runs a, a Santa themed theme park who uh, she's very sad because the Santa themed theme park is not making as much money as it used to. And then another woman arrives who works for some dude who's like, I want to turn that Santa theme theme park into a co-working space and meditation center. <laughs> um, because like they, they, my, my patrons chose the um, character trope of somebody who has a very specific, but completely unrealistic job. So the person who goes to analyze whether or not a theme park is worth turning into a co-working space and meditation center is both very specific and also ridiculous. Um, but watch somebody's job out there is that 
I feel like I made it up, but I bet if I Googled, I could find somebody who has that job. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. So yeah. So like, so, the two, so it's a, it's a enemy to friend to lover story. So at first the two women meet and they're like, ah, oh, no, this is terrible. And then, and then they become friendly. And then eventually um, under the Saturnalia tree, they will kiss. So somewhere in a dark alley in Portland right now, <laughs> poof. <laughs> it wasn't there five minutes ago but now it's doorway there. and it's now totally there's a, a consulting business because <laughs> <laughs> look like i you just i made also it happen, i also like there was the woman who is like you know doing this evaluation she works for somebody and at first i was like well he'll kind of be like adam newman the we work guy and then i was like you know what screw it like nobody's gonna read this for my patrons just adam newman and his wacky wife and they are the people that she works for. Because of course, Adam Newman would be the person to be like, wait a minute, that theme park would make a great co-working space. He would. <laughs> so, I mean, now he can't because he has to go away with his millions and cry deeply into his cup full of millions of dollars. It's very sad, but <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so I, I have to finish that this month as well as working on uh, my revision and I'm hoping that the revision will be do, done soon um, because I've actually had like quite a few agents who have expressed interest so I'm like oh, okay that's cool woohoo I hope I hope that that it I hope that proves to be an easy process for you <laughs> I hope so <laughs> well but I mean having people go I'm interested is actually a really great step so all fingers crossed thanks Um, very, very cool. Awesome. So actually I'm going to ask one quick question. Do you do a lot of like writing exercises of the sort that you sort of had your patrons set up for you? Um, I don't do a lot like that, but I do enjoy many writing exercises. Um, and I'm actually just like tomorrow, as a matter of fact, going to start, um, another one of my courses, which is just basically like get a writing exercise every day. Cause I, I am like very much a proponent of using writing exercises to practice. Mm. One of the things that has frustrated me as I've been like learning how to write. Um, and this has been true for like all of my sort of learning to write time, which is all the time yeah. um, that with writing, I never get much sense that, you know, writing teachers even suggest like just practicing, you know, just practicing for the sake of practicing, right? And mm -hmm. I, when I was in high school and then when I went to college, I was actually a music major. Mm, uh, I was yeah. a vocal student. And so I was always practicing that. And I was always practicing like whatever instrument I played. And when you're a dancer, you're always like practicing, you know, different moves and whatever, as well as <laughs> whatever choreography you've been taught or whatever, but also you just like practice. And it's the same with art, you practice. But in writing, there's not always like a, a push, I feel, for practice. People are just like, no, you just gotta go sit down and write some words. And I'm like, that's not always helpful. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah, so I have, for the past few years, I've been really pushing the idea of like writing exercises as practice. And then it's like, you can do a writing exercise and no one ever has to look at it but you. And yeah. that's okay. And I feel like part of the problem, because, you know, you, you have a lot of writers who talk about, you know, oh, I got on the internet and then such and so big name writer was like, I wrote this many words today. And so this other person, I wrote this many words. I wrote 10,000 words in a day. And you're like, great, thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah, whatever. that's kind of how I feel about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but like when they're talking about that, they're talking about it as if like that is some sort of, measure of I don't know what they did that day but it's like I could spend today writing a thousand words in writing practice and it wouldn't mean that like I had written a thousand publishable words and that's fine yeah and also like did I spend like a thousand words doing something that's actually going to make me a better writer or did I spend a thousand words like crying into my soup and <laughs> whatever yeah um so in you know I I am always like leery of like 
people and their word counts, but also leery of the idea that like you have to sit down and you have to pump out all these words and and that like has some sort of meaning. Like, but what I feel has meaning is sitting down and doing a writing exercise that allows you to challenge yourself or allows you to do something that you're kind of scared of doing mm -hmm. on the page um, in fiction um, or just like, you know, working out aspects of your writing that you're, you don't feel you are 100% up on like in your craft. Yeah. So um, I do a lot of writing exercises that are just basically me looking at a picture and then just like writing something based on the picture, which is just, you know, like, it's just a fun way to get like sort of gears turning in my mm -hmm. brain for fiction. But also I sometimes sit down and like write descriptions because I'm, I feel like I'm really bad at description. Um, and, and so sometimes I'm just like, let me just like write this shitty description. And then later on, I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to like write mm -hmm. a better version of this description and hone it, whatever. But it's also great because like, I never have to show that to anybody. Um, yeah. And, and so, yeah, like I do, I do a lot of that. Like what's supposed to happen is I'm supposed to be doing writing exercises on a sort of daily basis and then putting some of those up for my patrons. Do I do that? No, I have to start. It's 2020. My 2020 <laughs> energy is that I'm going to do that for my patrons. I'm so sorry. Um, but, but part of the reason is just like, I haven't been doing writing practice as much, uh, especially in the past year as I wanted to. Um, mm -hmm because I have this job where I teach people things. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, oh man. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I still, I still really like just love the, the process of just sitting down and like doing, doing something fun. That's just for me. That's just for me to look at and not necessarily like for other people. So I also really like writing games, like solo games. I'm discovering is like a whole thing where like the whole point of the game is just you sitting down with your notebook and doing stuff. And I was like, I love this. I want more of this in my life. Yeah, that's cool. Well, yeah. So there's the whole question of, of game storytelling and, mm. and story storytelling and all that interesting stuff too. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what have you been teaching? I have been teaching so many classes about how to write the other. That is That's what I figured big these days. And so, yeah, I just, I, um, I spend basically that's, that is almost 100% of my income at this point. Wow. Teaching those classes. Um, and I find a lot of joy in it because they're, I mean, obviously it's a skill that I want more writers to have so that yeah. I can read better things and not have to go out into the world and look at things and be like, I am so angry about this. Let me just throw it across the room. Um, I would yeah. definitely like to have less of that. But also I have found that, you know, just a lot of my students are really awesome people. And mm -hmm. it's so nice to be surrounded by people who are really working hard and thinking about these things. Uh, and then, you know, something will come up where I'm like, my goodness, look at all these awesome folks just like being amazing and, and like taking these lessons to heart and whatnot. Like every now and then something will come up and I'll be like, I'm so proud to like know these people. So, so it's very rewarding in that way. Um, and last year we, we started doing a thing where we have like a set of classes that we're going to give every year on mm -hmm. a cycle. Um, and then there'll be other classes that pop up every now and again. And so last year was a lot of, you know, doing the setup to make sure that those yeah. that are coming every year are going to be easy for us to like launch each time we do them. That's a very practical approach in terms of just being able to sustain and not like burn out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Having to constantly reinvent stuff. It's exhausting. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't help when the tools that you use are just like, we're just going to up and change everything. Google. Google. <laughs> I am right there with you. <laughs> we were betrayed. <laughs> yeah. They're just like, every time you turn around, they're betraying you. And I'm like, why? No, no, no. We're not right on Google anymore. We're on, on Discord. <laughs> yes. Yes. It was never a thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, but hey. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, long ago and far away and besides that service is dead mm -hmm. cool so so um 
As far as is teaching uh, the classes about writing the other, are there um, particular topics within that umbrella that you feel um, are your particular passion or, or focus? Hmm. Well, I feel like the one that I enjoy probably the most is our description class. Uh, and that might be because of, again, like how I had all this trouble with description. And so I like sort of made myself sit and work on it. Mm -hmm. And, and I really enjoy sharing some of the things that I sort of figured out along the way. Um, as I was like trying to think about like, well, what makes a good description and, and things of that nature. So, um, like pretty much all the material from that class, probably I developed, mm. uh, because a lot of the material in the different classes was either developed, uh, by me and Nisi Shaw, uh, who's one of the co-writers of the books right. or the book, um, or it was developed by Nisi or it was developed in conjunction with one of the other people that we have come teach. Um, and I actually like I enjoy doing all the classes, but the one that I feel like I have sort of the least amount of footing on and which I always like make Nisi be the forefront person on is the dialogue and dialect one, um, because that started from a lecture that she originated in. And I well, I feel like I have a pretty good handle on dialogue. I I don't feel like I have a good handle on dialect, uh, which, is, which is about to be hard because um, in this middle grade novel, I did decide that you know, since the majority of the characters that are in it are African-American, that I was going to have them speak in Af African-American vernacular English, which means that I have to sort of dig back into like my, you know, the, the way that I talked when I was a kid, but like how that contrasts with the way that kids talk now, because I know that there are some similarities. There are also some differences. Like I was trying to figure out if kids even said rad anymore. And I was like, do I even say rad? I can't remember. <laughs> like, <laughs> crap like what do the children say these days um and then like I feel like I should be able to ask um my nephews and nieces about this but they like every time I ask them they're just like what are you even talking about and then they don't want to <laughs> they don't want to explain <laughs> like, how they speak and I'm like you guys are not helpful um so yeah but but the only reason why I would have considered tackling doing that is because uh, of this class, because like I said, Nisi was the one who mainly developed, um, you know, those lectures and the exercises that we do and stuff. And so I learned essentially from, you know, being in that class with her while she taught it, you know, all these things about, you know, how, how to make dialect work, um, when to use it and when not, you know, things of that nature. Um, so yeah, I just, I'm like, I just, study at the foot of the master that is what I do um that's awesome yeah and the class that I actually enjoyed putting together the most mm -hmm. was our world building class um and we ran that for the first time last year uh and we're gonna run it like once every year going forward and the thing that I love the most about that class is the fact that I was able to bring together so many different voices on it Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, like I am not really an instructor in that class. What I did was I asked a bunch of other people who are really good world builders to like talk about like some specific aspect of world building. So I brought in Max Gladstone and he was talking about ideology and I brought in Kate Elliott and she talked about, um, analog cultures and, and how to, how like the pitfalls of that and how to do it well. I brought in Jamie Go to talk about research like anti-colonialism in research um, and Stephen Barnes to talk about like sociobiology and Andrea Hairston to talk about cosmology and just like all these different people. And so I, number one, even though I knew what I, what I wanted these people to talk about, um, I learned so much just from like watching their lectures, you know, and I had to be the one to edit them. So I learned sure, a whole bonus lot. for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause I was like, Oh, just... Hey, look, I'm getting my own private class. <laughs> right. Exactly. And, um, and yeah, I, I really love the way that like all the material falls together, even though nobody necessarily consulted each other about like what they were going to talk about, whatever. But, but I like the way that it all comes together because essentially everybody's saying, you know, they're saying things that have the same sensibility. Like nobody's disagreeing about whether or not like these things are important. Um, they, they often reiterate what somebody else has said in their lecture. 
um, mm -hmm. even without having you know seen that lecture um, when talking about their specific topic. And so I, I really love putting that class together. I really love how it came together. And I was so happy that the students who were in it were very engaged and they asked really great questions. They had all these really great conversations. Like I didn't necessarily even need to be there. Like I just let them go and, and, they, and they went off and did it. So that was really great. So I really enjoyed putting that together. I'm really, in, I'm, I am looking forward to doing that one every year. It sounds, um, dare I say, rad. <laughs> Super rad. <laughs> I think um, my sister uses my story, The Ace of Knives, as an example of code switching in maybe the dialogue and dialect class. Yes. It's, it's Tanya. How are you doing, man? Hi, Tanya. Yes, Tempest actually, and I go way back. We do, actually. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so we, we not only <laughs> use that, we have used um, excerpts from it uh, in, mm. in the lecture that she gives when she talks about code switching. But ever since we, because we used to do the class where it was just like everything all together. So we talked about characterization and description and dialogue and world building and research. Like we put everything together. But um, it was very exhausting, <laughs> I would say, for the students because it would just be like so much information. I mean, it's already so much information. So then when we decided to sort of break out each of the different major sections into their own thing, one of the things that made me really happy about that, besides the fact that I could give people more writing exercises, which I love to do, um, it also meant that we had more room for the students to then read whole pieces of fiction hmm. in order to, um, to analyze them. And so we have them actually read your whole story. Oh, um, okay. And yeah, and, and so they, they get to have a discussion about like all the different places in which you, you know, use dialect or, or use code switching and all this stuff. And then we have them read um, Midnight Robber by Nella Hopkinson. That's the one novel that we have them read, but we also have them read several different short stories. And that's, that I think is one of my favorite things about breaking the, the different sections out into its own things, like having the space to not only give them the lessons, but also like have them actually read fiction where it's like, this is what we're talking about and, and see it in total and, and have them have a discussion about it and respond to it. And everybody always loves your story, Tanya. Oh! So, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, Look Tanya. at this amazing story that you must read. And then they're all like, this is amazing. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Nalo, um, I just sub, sub, I just like earlier today or yesterday was it? I submitted a short story that's mostly in Trinidadian English, and then it code switches to standard English. But um, the thing that I wanted to point out was that I had actually the only person I can really ask for help in terms of feedback, in terms of if I did everything right, was Nalo. And she had this big brain thing where she talked about, um, she told me I should probably, ha I have to look at representing language as a uh, or representing pronunciation. And she had told mm. me at that point I had done, I was doing both, but I was doing it inconsistently. So I decided to choose to just do language and leave the pronunciation to the reader. Like she said, she, had, she, she tends to do. Cause yeah. that's, that seems to be the more logical point. I mean, choice. But yeah, it, it, you know, when she had that big brain moment, I was like, I knew I should have asked her something. It's a good thing. I didn't just figure I know everything, you know? So, I mean, I, I'm quite sure that they would be fascinated by Nalo's Midnight Robber. I mean, I don't have to read it. I know what a Midnight Robber is. And mm -hmm. I didn't that until I was about 15. So that culture is familiar to me, but I'm quite sure like North Americans would be fascinated by it. Cause she did a whole big, big fat world building thing there. Oh yeah. Oh, definitely. And, and like, I, I have been trying to switch out the, the novels that we use um, specifically, not as much the short stories because the short stories, it's, it's not as much of a time commitment to sit down and write a short story. So I'm like, right, you guys right, can read right. that same, those same ones. Um, but the novel, I, I keep wanting to switch out only because um, there, sometimes it's just that I'm like, this novel is very long and this class is three weeks. Yeah. Uh, and, but sometimes it's also like, you know, with Midnight Robber, especially, mm -hmm. that is a very complex book. And what we're having them read it for is looking at not only like 
the dialect within the dialogue, but also the narrative voices in dialect too. And so it's that's one of the reasons why we chose it because we wanted to show them like how that worked uh, in mm -hmm. both ways, but also like there's a, there's a lot of stuff. It's a very heavy book. And so I, I've been leaning more towards like not quite as heavy a book, mm -hmm. um, only for like the teaching aspect of it. Mm. But, but man, like we have had some really awesome conversations and discussions with our students, like as they take a look at that book, because even though, you know, obviously they're looking at it um, to analyze certain craft aspects of it. They're also just like, this book is amazing. You know? So that's, that's always really that looks good, man. That looks good. Yeah. She, she is one of those people who can actually like, she, she can, it's in, what is that expression? Those who can do and those who cannot teach. She mm. can, and she teaches anyway. So yes. she can do all the things. Yeah, she basically, you know? Nalo is some sort of goddess who was sent to us, and we don't appreciate her. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. I, this is the first time I, I I realized somebody else calls her a goddess. I call her my. <laughs> yep. I call her a goddess too. I said she's my goddess. You know. Uh, you know. Um, she and I know. I like we met because of the online writing workshop because she saw something that I put up. And that's how I came on her radar. But apparently um, she and I have a connection through my mom's friends. Mm. Um, there's a friend of my mother's who um, founded the National Heritage Library of Trinidad and Tobago. And she, she's, really, she's really important down there culturally. And um, when I told her that I ran into Nalo, she goes, oh, Nalo's one of my children, quote unquote <laughs> children, because apparently this woman and Nalo's um, dad had founded a couple of, um, of, of acting theater, uh, theater studios in the Caribbean and various countries. And I'm like, I give up. That's when I started using my real name. Because um, <laughs> I was at that point, I was like, I'm walking up a mountain and my family's already up there wondering why I'm taking the long road when there's a shortcut over there. So I just stopped using, uh, I just gave up. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you will excuse me um, for interrupting just a bit, we have five minutes left in our hour. So I wanted to um, make sure that everybody who is attending has a chance to ask some brief questions if you would like. So um, anyone? Questions. Ask about the world building, guys. Ask <laughs> about the world building. <laughs> I Actually, wanna... what I was going to ask is, um, we should probably form a secret cabal to um, anoint Nisi a goddess at WISCON this year. I I approve of that. Uh, okay. That secret plan because yeah, Hello, like Nisi and Tanana Reeve. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much because because okay. yeah, like all the stuff that I that I do around writing the other is all one hundred percent because of Nisi. Like I I learned this framework from her, and part of the reason why. We started doing the classes is because I was like, Nisi, these classes are so great, but you only sort of do them, you know, at con sometimes or whatever. And I was like, maybe you should do them online. She's like, I don't know how to do that. And I'm like, guess what? I do. So let's do this. <laughs> um, but you know, so I I have learned a lot from it. But I I did that because like because I learned a lot. I was like, more people should have the opportunity to learn about this uh, from you. So yes, I am. Um, you know, one of the things that makes me so happy to talk with you is I am just thrilled to hear how writing the other is blooming and turning into something bigger and has more space to just, you know, let people focus and, and move from area to area. It's such a huge and rich topic. Um, I'm just, yeah, it's just really wonderful to see what's happening with it. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited because, you know, it, other than like just getting the stuff out there that um, Nisi and Cynthia Ward you know, put out in the book and then um, being able to go deeper into that is also really nice. Um, but also then being able to like bring in all these other voices, you know, we have master classes where somebody's like, let me talk to you about trans non-binary voices. Let me talk to you about asexual mm -hmm. characters. You know, it's like things that we cannot bring because we literally do not have that experience. But now we have a framework so that we can allow other people who have the expertise to to bring that to students and and that's also like that's very it's very fulfilling for me mm -hmm. so yeah i love it um i have a question yes so um i have uh i have uh, uh nisi and cynthia ward's book and that i was noticing noticing came out like in 2005 and that was from yeah. their 
and then you've been doing all these classes. I'm on your Facebook group and I see all the things that you, you talk about and all that. And um, so the writing, the other thing as a thing, as a, as a concept has been around for at least 15 years now. And it's, it's, I also like that it's growing and, and diversifying, but that's been, it's been around long enough that all the classes you're teaching and the book from Aqueduct and the classes she was originally teaching that the book is based on, um, do you see them having an effect on the genre? Because presumably a lot of writers have read the book or have, you know, followed your group on Facebook or taken your classes or, you know, that was like Clarion has an effect on the genre. And we could talk, we could do a whole talk about that because I'm yeah. a Clarion East graduate. And um, <laughs> I, think, I think, what have you, since you're in the center of it, what have you seen the effect on literature that has, if any, that is, that you could tease apart from everything else uh, that's visible uh, as a result of all these years of uh, work? Well, I definitely see um, a change in the conversation around how, how we do this, how we write the other. Um, and, and I have seen, you know, especially like in the books that have been published by, by people who I know are my students or our students, um, you know, I've seen that effect because they're, they are writing books that are very, you know, aware and um, not necessarily careful, but like respectful. And so the, the end result is something that I'm like, oh, like that is something that I'm really happy to read. It didn't like ping me and make me go like, oh no, why would you do this? <laughs> like, why would you create these characters? It's so terrible. Um, and, and I think like the overall conversation has made a lot of people pause <laughs> and, and really just think. Um, one of the things, it, it's more on an individual level uh, that I see stuff. But I remember at one point, like I had been contacted by somebody asking if I would do a sensitivity read. And I ended up doing a sensitivity read on like a very detailed outline first before they actually sent me the book. And I had this feedback about like their, their main character who was this young black boy. And the, one of the cruxes of the story was the fact that like he had never known his father um, and then his mother like kind of drops him off at the doorstep of the, the father's mother, his grandmother, who he's never, also never met. And, and they went through like an actually like, it was a really beautiful story, but I was like, I need you to think about the fact that you have a young black boy who doesn't have a father. And this is such a trope. And like, why do we have this? And like, is there, is there something else that you can do? And, and in teasing out what it is she wanted to do was that she wanted, she really at her heart wanted to write a story about growing up in this particular sort of rural um, working class area and dispelling the myths around rural working class people, you know, from, you know, this, this Southern area that she comes from. And, but she also didn't want to like erase the reality that there are black people there too. You know, and that's why she had felt that she needed to have a black boy as her protagonist. And so we talked about ways in which she didn't necessarily have to have that, you know, a person with that identity as her protagonist would still bring in these other things. And then when she sent me the actual book, oh my God, the book was amazing. Um, and, and I really loved it. And I, you know, I still had um, a couple of notes for her, but like the way that she changed what was going on with the boy and this, you know, grandmother figure and the way they talked about race. And she brought in all this stuff. And that is the kind of thing I feel like is actually happening except for we're not necessarily seeing all the steps, right? We're seeing mm -hmm. the finished product. But like, I do feel like there are more authors who are thinking, do I need to tell the story that I want to tell with this kind of person mm -hmm. as my protagonist? Or can I include these kinds of people as my secondary characters? And can I include these kinds of situations or this culture or whatever? And so I do think that we, we are seeing more finished products that are the result of a lot of that careful thinking. But we may not always know that it is a result of that careful thinking because like I said, we haven't seen the process. But I do think it's happening. Like, I do think that we are slowly but surely getting more stories that are actually like well thought out and respectful and aware of these things that are still really great stories. All right, well on that note, and it's 5.02, <laughs> I think what we'll do is I'm gonna say 
thank you, Tempest. It's just been a delight to have you. I, I think all of your projects sounds really wonderful and fascinating. I'm so happy about all of the amazing work you're doing for the genre and for literature as a whole. Um, it's been great to have you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your questions and the conversation. I really enjoyed it. I'm going to turn off the YouTube. <laughs>